you again, Toya. It's nice to see you. How are you? I'm very well. Are you well? Oh, I'm all right. Thank Ready you. Ready to go. Fighting fit. Uh, Toya, you've made it to the top as an actress and a singer in the, in the business. No mean feat. Do you think it's, it's harder being a woman in this business? <coughs> I, I keep forgetting I am a woman. No, no <laughs> sort of innuendos there. I just sort of plough ahead and get on with things. Um, the biggest difficulty I've always find is people think because you are a woman, maybe you, you are a bit weak, you, mm -hmm. you, you have weaknesses, you, you're, you're not business-minded, things like that. And that I found a problem, is in a, in a way, always feeling that I have to prove myself, to prove that, I'm, if anything, I'm equal. Oh, if not better than men. <laughs> no, yeah. sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't resist that. <laughs> so do you think you have to, in fact, become tougher to prove that you are as tough? If, if no, you know you've got I mean. to be really level-headed. Um, I think when you make a mistake, that mistake's underlined mm. more than if a, a bloke made that mistake. I think you've just got to be on your toes the whole time and just very, very careful, really. Uh, Liz Thompson here, I'd like to bring into the conversation. Hello and welcome. You've written a book called New Women in Rock. You're on the first page of this, actually, Toya. Uh, let me ask you, Liz, how do you think the wom woman's role in the music business has changed over the, the last decade or so? Well, I think it lies in what Toya has just said. I think the increasing feminist consciousness of the early 1970s, and I hate to sound like a rabid feminist because I'm not, um, really, you know, the first women to, to break into that really broke down some barriers and made it possible for a lot of others to follow. And I think the punk explosion of 1977, I mean, really brought with it, I'm sure Toya would agree, a whole lot of people who, who really leapt on stage and played lead guitar and bass guitar and drums as good as any man ever did. I mean, the Honeycomb's token female drama way back in 1964, you know, had nothing on these people. I don't know. I, I mean, to me, I, I'm a six-year-old kid now, boy, female or a boy, doesn't matter anymore. They're so far ahead. They're so much more intelligent than when I was that age, right. and I think it's a natural progression. As we, we, we realise that we, we, our roles are equal, yeah. uh, and we should do what we're happiest at doing. Yeah, I think we should stop thinking about women and men in rock. I mean, yeah. I think the best thing is uh, the talking head situation of when a woman is actually integrated into the band as a musician. I mean, never mind what goddamn sex she is. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's there and she's there. She's a good, good musician. I mean, that's what it should be. And um, I hope we're going to move in that direction as it kind of all sort of settles down in the 1980s, that we but really do admit, get some good I, music. I mean, I've never seen a man who looks as good as Bo Derek. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've got a point there. <laughs> Let's Fight go back that out to, to 1966 for a moment, because I want to bring our next guest in. Let's just have a little listen to this, this record. You Don't Have to Say You Love Me, which of course is a huge hit for uh, Dusty Springfield. Uh, it was co-written by Simon Napier-Bell. Hello, Simon. And You Don't Have to Say You Love Me is the title of your book, which really does take the lid off the music business. Uh, tell me, what do you, what do you think that, about what these two have had to say about women's role in, in the music business? Well, I heard Liz just now say she thought that um, we shouldn't talk about women or men in rock. And I'm amazed to see she's got a book here called Women in Rock. <laughs> Good point, yeah. You fell into that one slightly, I suppose. Yeah. yeah, I fell into it, true. I mean, why write a book on new women in rock? I mean, why not do a book on short people in rock? I mean, it's true. I think it's just interesting that at this point in time, the charts are simply flooded with women mm. musicians. I mean, I just think that's an interesting social phenomenon, and perhaps it's more interesting sociologically than it is musically. Simon, just back to you for a moment, because you actually went into the music business sort of as an accident, didn't you, really? More or less, yeah. I mean, you don't have to say you love me, just happened, didn't it? Yeah, well, a friend of mine phoned me up. Uh, she was um, Vicky Wickham, who used to produce Ready, Steady, Go, and she phoned up. She had a song which Dusty Springfield had brought back from Italy. And uh, we wanted some Italian English lyrics for it. So I said, fine, it sounds quite easy. And uh, we just sat down and did them in about 10 minutes. I mean, it's quite easy because it was rather funny. She, she, I said, it's Italian, it's got to be very uh, passionate. It's got to be, I love you. And she said, oh, that's no, terrible. So I said, you love me. And she said, it's just as bad. <laughs> so I said, well, you don't love me. She said, oh, it's getting better. And, <laughs> Three more words made the pattern. You know, well, of course, like everyone that. analysed the real true meaning behind this. Yeah, it was just doing yeah. the song quickly. That's all. You got into management after that. You managed the Yardbirds. Mm -hmm. That sort of just happened for you as well, didn't it? They kind yeah. Of well, what happened is I, I thought writing songs perhaps wasn't what I wanted to do, and she suggested managing, and I put together a, a duo as a, a black girl and a, a white boy, and I promoted them rather um, pushily, mm. and drew a lot of attention to them and myself, and then the Yardbirds just phoned up to where I managed them. It sounded like a nice idea. I said, OK. Did you know much about it, though, nothing at that at stage? Nothing at all. Absolutely nothing. No. But you just managed to sort of coast along on instinct. Well, I knew you? about business. So yeah. you just applied business to a new area and uh, kept one step ahead of them. Now, Toya, of course, you've been managing without a manager for the oh, last couple yeah. of months. And how has that worked for you? It must be... Oh, a... it's been terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just been... 
I, I mean, I, I chose, well, the, the whole band chose to, to go without a manager for a bit. We didn't intend to manage ourselves because mm. that's a bit pretentious. We're not, we're not that clever. Uh, it's just too busy. I think the manager's job is one of the hardest jobs. He's got to be everywhere. He's got to be your wet nurse. He's got to be, be your nanny, everything. Um, and I, I'm, I have found it quite hard. Not having someone to phone in the morning. I, I wake at six in the morning with these ludicrous ideas. Write them all down, and you then I them at six. Don't ask me to manage. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I expect I'll to. I've got another group of phone to four the night like before. <laughs> really? Yeah. But I expect to pick the phone up and, and say, "Look, you've got to do this. Help me, help me. I've got this idea." And I had no one to do it to. So I do think managers are, are a, a treasure. But I, they're just so hard to find these days. What the business the... is overcrowded. You didn't know you were matchmaking. So <laughs> <interesting>. <laughs> no, that's right. What about the dangers of being ripped off, Toy? I mean, there's a wonderful quote that I read of yours the other day, which said, "You're going to study law next so that you don't lose any more money." I mean, have, <laughs> uh, have you have you made money? Yes. Good. Yes. <laughs> Oh my God, I'm getting in deep water. Uh, no, no. Yes, we have, we have, while we've been on our own, we have, but I'm not saying that our manager ripped us off, we just didn't get on with him, he wasn't right for us. Um, <laughs> but at the same, at the same time, I, I don't know, I'm trying not, I don't, don't want to put management down, they're very, no, I, very important. No, but what about the going back to the, I mean, uh, back to you for a moment, Simon, there's, there's daily, there's cases in the papers, uh, Sting currently suing, uh, Gilbert O'Sullivan, the Bee Gees, all suing management or record companies. Can you explain that Sting was suing Virgin over a contract which is exactly the same as his own manager signed other writers to? Right. So this isn't a matter of really anyone being ripped off, it's a matter of a manager saying, look, we can get some money here, let's have a go. And, um, you know, that's a quite different situation from what you're talking about. I don't usually find groups are ripped off. They, they very frequently think they've earned money they haven't earned. They don't understand how much they're spending. But, but what about back in the 60s when groups were signed up and they were offered 50 quid a week and then go off and do all the gigs under the sun? The 60s, sun? it was very, very different. There was still that situation where people could, could be paid a salary and the manager could earn the money. There was also a situation that generally managers were, had a very cr strong creative side. They put the groups together. They had the ideas for the... Uh, for the image and for the music. Mm. But generally nowadays, a manager, should th if he's going to be successful, should think of himself in the same way as a lawyer would think of himself. You know, the group of your clients, and you're, really, you're, you're there to help them and to make sure that they get what they want. You, there's a quote in your book that says you can make as much money having a number one as, as from having a flop. Mm, can you possible. explain that? It just doesn't really make <laughs> sense. <laughs> well, the business is really based, the record business is based on um, record companies thinking they found something good. Yeah. And record companies don't really know something good from something bad, nor does anyone else in the business. It's a very unpredictable business. So if you can go in there and persuade them that you've got something fantastic, they do come up with amazing advances. It's not that unusual to hear of a million pound advance, a million dollar advance. Mm. And uh, perhaps if you're selling them something which isn't going to happen, you're doing what you just said, making a million dollars out of a flop. They'll, yeah. What about record hyping? Do you think that, I mean, in, back in the 60s and now, do you think the way it's done has, has changed very much? The way it's done, completely different, but the morality is the same. I and mean, You really can't say there's any difference between now when a record company employs a marketing expert who's got a degree in university in marketing, devises a clever method of marketing a record into the top 40 before it's justifiably a top 40 popular record. That's really exactly the same as the 60s when you just phoned up and bought a place by asking the music paper how much they'd charge for 28 or 29. It does really mean, though, that if record hyping is going to go on, that the public aren't really having the chance to buy the records that they like. Oh, yes, they, they are. I don't, I don't believe there's a single record in the top 30 which is not genuinely popular. What the, what the record hyping does is it gets a record into, say, the top 75 before it's genuinely a, a popular 75 record. Mm. Can I just ask you, Liz, finally, do you think there's any outstanding female around at the moment who is not actually come through because of bad management? Well, if we've not actually come through because of bad management, then we don't know about them yet. I think there are a lot of interesting bands on the London club scene, and I hope some of them will break through. Um, Jam Today is just one such f um, feminist collective. Mm. But, I mean, I, th I think rock basically, I um, hate to say this in front of a rock star, <laughs> is basically a, a fairly transient genre. And I think what will happen is what always happens, that the ones who don't have so much to offer will fall by the wayside. And the ones who have gen something genuine to say, um, like Toyer, like uh, Kate Bush, like Joan Armour Trading, and a number of others, are really going to build on their talent and expand and be here um, at the turn of the 80s if we're all here. I think the most important thing is to keep, keep the big business ideas out of it and keep entertainment yeah. as entertainment. Yeah. Really do. Well, we'd like you to do some more entertainment for us now, Yeah, Toya. I, I want to get Off up. Off you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all very much. It's very interesting to talk to you.